Well, we're going to uh, kick off a new series today entitled The Way. And um, no, this is not The Mandalorian. They stole it from the Bible. Thieves couldn't come up with their own ideas. But <laughs> I've had something kind of st stirring on my heart, and uh, I, I took off to Red Lodge for uh, a little bit Friday and Saturday and just kind of had some stuff stirring. And uh, this, is, this is what uh, came out of me, and I want to open up with John chapter 14, verses 5 through 7. And here's what it says. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I think it's pretty obvious that Jesus is pointing out there's no other way. You know, in this day and age, that is not politically correct. That's not culturally, culturally correct. He's literally saying, I am the way. I'm not one of many ways. I'm not one of many possibilities or many ideas or many concepts. He's just laying it out there. Not only I am the way, I am the truth. Another word that culture just doesn't like. Culture doesn't like absolutes. You know, everybody wants to believe whatever they want to believe. And they're welcome to do that, but that doesn't change the fact that there is truth. There are absolutes. And so I was kind of, you know, processing this, this concept and of Jesus declaring, you know, that he is the absolute truth. And, and actually, uh, he doubles down on that in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, by making this statement, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's only one way. I actually really appreciate that God made it so, so simple. <laughs> we, we don't have to pick and choose. We don't have to wonder. He's just saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But unfortunately, whether it's sin, whether it's stubbornness, whether it's pride, whether it's deception, people push back against what God is offering through his son Jesus. They push back against the truth. They push, push back, you know, against the love that um, he extends to us. And, and it's crazy because ultimately God is love and he loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And it's out of that great love that he speaks truth, he gives truth, and he wants us to live a life, a full life, that's full of his provision and his purpose. But the enemy loves to pervert truth. I mean, ask anyone what truth is. Ask anyone the definition of love. <laughs> People are confused. Actually, there's a new series out. What is a woman? Ask anybody that. People are confused. They're, they're not sure. People are afraid to process and think and to receive the reality of what the truth of God's word is. You know, when you look at Paul in the uh, in New Testament, he actually makes the statement in, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 24. You know, and he's kind of, he's making his legal defense before the Roman officials and, and this is what he says. He says, However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. I want to stop there for a second. As a follower of the way, you see, they, they, they had, back then, they had their Jewish customs and their traditions and the way they did things, and they wanted to be very clear that Jesus' way was very different than the Jewish culture and traditions gone by. So they actually called it the way. Before they were called Christians, that's what they referred to themselves as. They were followers of the way. And so he goes on here. It says, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. So here is Paul boldly proclaiming what he believes. In our day and age, people want us to keep what we believe or think to ourselves. Because they don't want to hear anything else. 
And, and he goes on here and he says, he says, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And in verse 16 he says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, when you put all of that together, what I really see Paul saying is, yes, there's stuff from the past I believe, and there's stuff from the future that I'm looking forward to, but let me tell you, this is about how I'm going to live my day-to-day -day life. This is how I'm gonna live my day-to-day -day life. This is the way. And I am a follower of the way. I believe what God says. I believe the truth of his word. I believe who Jesus is. I believe that he died for my sins. And I am banking my life and everything on it. He's all in. Proverbs 14, 12 says, you know, there is a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it leads to death. So we got to make sure that we are followers of the way. So the first message I want to give to you in this series is entitled, Obsolete or Absolute? Obsolete or Absolute? Now, if something is obsolete, that means it's, it's out of date and it's been replaced with something better, something new and improved, something more efficient, Something that works better for everybody. If something is absolute, that means it has not diminished in any way. It's total, it's complete, it's perfect, it's not mixed or adulterated, and it's pure. So is the word of God, is God's plan obsolete or is it absolute? Now I tell you, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The principles of God's word, they don't change. Culture obviously changes, right? We don't eat the same, look the same, dress the same, drive the same, none of that. But God's principles do not change. So I mentioned that I kind of got away Friday and Saturday, and uh, I went up to a friend of mine's cabin I actually got a picture of the cabin here. And uh, I, I put my truck in front of it just to prove that I was actually there and took those pictures. So it's not necessarily what everybody would call a cabin. It is absolutely gorgeous. So I'm up there, up in the woods, you know, I'm, I'm locked into the house, I'm locked into a private gate, I'm up in there, you know, and, and it's pretty awesome. And I'm sitting there kind of studying and meditating and I start looking around. Go to the next slide. I want to I wanna look at some of these things because when you think of obsolete, you think of something that's kind of, it's come and it's gone. And this entire cabin is almost completely built of old things. But old things that are not doing what their intended original purpose was. So you look at, and up there in the top, that, that's a bench. Well, actually, no, it's a headboard for a bed that's been turned into a bench. You know, that's, that's a milk jug. No, it's actually the top of a toilet now. <laughs> and it helps flush that toilet. And everywhere I looked, I saw things that are obsolete, that are no longer being used for their intended purpose. You know, all those railings inside there, those are like fence posts. Some of them still have like things dug into them, but they've been repurposed and they, everything's been repurposed that's a ladder that's hanging as lights with pulleys and i mean I'm, I'm sitting at the kitchen table i look up and there's a bat like cut off sticking out like my friend is so creative and so, like in this entire cabin is like this but unfortunately that's where i was really mulling around the concept of the way which is why i made the logo look the way it looks because a lot of people in our culture want to take the word of God and say, you know, it had its place. It had a season. It had a purpose at one point. But now, that way of thinking, that way of living, that's old. You need to take that and put it on the shelf. That Bible should be a decoration. It, it's not any good. It's not pertinent. It's not relevant. It has nothing to do with where we are currently at in our life and in our culture. And I'm telling you, 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the things that they struggled with back in the day, we still struggle with today. The same desires, the same sins, the same you know, temptations, it's all there. And God's word is full. It is full of truth and wisdom that will absolutely transform our lives if we're willing to let it. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9 says this. It says, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. So he's talking to the people of God, talking about all the incredible things that God has done. He says, teach them. Teach these principles and not just the principles, the things you've experienced by applying those principles to your life. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So God wasn't just throwing out a one-time commandment here. He, he was throwing out a principle by which if we would begin to take the things that we know we've been taught, we've applied to our life, we've seen, we've heard, and we know to be true, and we pass them on to the next generation, and the next generation, then the truth of God's word would continue to go and to flourish. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 45, verse 17. This is such a beautiful truth. It says, I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. The, the, the psalmist is declaring, I understand that if I take these truths that I know to be true, and I perpetuate them, I teach them, I live them, I pass them on, then what's going to happen is God is going to be glorified forever and ever. Because they're true. His word is living and it's active and it's powerful and it touches and it changes hearts and lives. That's why we're doing kids blast. That's why we do kids camp. That's why we do kids church. It's the next generation. That's why, you know, uh, Kayla who just took over the, the, the nursery, why she wants them to be learning things in the nursery, not just be taken care of. She wants them hearing the word and knowing the word and, and getting this inside of them because it's powerful. It touches and it changed hearts. And if we don't teach the next generation, the world will gladly teach their principles and their concepts, and their ideas. And we're living in a generation where, where people don't truly know. There's a whole generation that's being raised up that doesn't know what some of us older people like me know or were taught. <laughs> I'm over 50, so there's things that, I've, th that I know that, that they have no idea, no concept of. Because our culture keeps changing. But no matter how much our culture changes, we have got to stay anchored to the truth of God's word. We have got to stay rooted and grounded in the way. But more than that, we can't be selfish. We can't be selfish. We've got to take these principles that have touched and changed our lives. And we've got to begin to pass them on. And we've got to begin to pass them on to generation after generation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. It says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So you understand that people of the world who don't know God, who don't have a relationship with God, they can't wrap their brain around why we think the way we think as, as believers. They, they don't understand why we have convictions, why we do things or don't do things or, 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 or why we're okay with this and not with that. Like they just don't understand because those things are spiritually discerned. So I totally get it when someone in the world freaks out about Christians. I really do. Because they don't have the spirit of God. But what really makes me sad is when believers who have been given the ability to know the truth when it comes to the truth, they let their emotions and they let the culture blind them. So they're trying to look at God's word. They're, you know, they're sitting in church. They're, they're trying to get a concept and figure out what, what should I do, what should I, and, and they just can't see. And they, they don't get it. They, they don't understand. Why, why is everybody in an uproar? Why is this a problem? Let people do whatever they want to do. Do you understand? 
take God out of the picture for a second. If we lived in a culture where everybody got to do what everybody wants to do, it'd be chaos. There has to be some kind of moral law or moral code somewhere, right? There has to be. It's insanity to think that, that we could function without something like that. But again, my challenge for you guys today, especially as believers, is we've got to make sure that when we're looking at the truth of God, we're not letting our emotions and culture dictate what we see and dictate what we think and dictate what's okay or not okay. Well, you know, I know it says it in the Bible, but ooh, we don't want to go there. That's not who we want to be. All right, so if you truly believe that God's way is not obsolete, then I'm going to give you three quick areas that should be unchanging absolutes in your life. Just three, because I like to give three. It's just the way I am. It's just my specialty. I deliver three. So here's the first one that should be unchanging and absolute. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. It doesn't say if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you want to go to heaven or that you think the whole Jesus idea is pretty cool and being forgiven is pretty cool and you'd like to be forgiven of your sins because the guilt is really lame and you're done with feeling guilty all the time. No, it says if you declare that Jesus is Lord, Lordship. Now that, that's something that <laughs> we're taught in our culture is horrible. That's like communism. Lordship. But it's not the type of lordship that, that you would think of. It really isn't. There's, there's an understanding where you, you understand that greater is he, that he has a plan and a purpose that's bigger than you, that he has a love and, 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 and a power that you don't have by yourself, and you understand that by submitting your heart, your life, your plans, and your wills to his lordship, your life is going to be so much better. You're going to live with a greater purpose. You're going to have everything. His word says that he gives us everything we need for life and godliness, the natural, the spiritual. It all comes from him. Why would you turn away from that? Why would you turn away from true lordship? And as I was trying to think about this concept of, of lordship, I was uh, reminded of a story that I'm going to kind of use for all three of my points here. And it's out of the book of Acts, chapter 11. And it's the story of the seven sons of uh, Sceva. We all know the seven sons of Sceva. We hang out with them every now and then. Well, actually, we just hang out with people very much like them. And so I want to start reading in verse 11. It says, uh, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase some of this so it's not going to be on the screen. It says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, obviously, the power of God was so moving <laughs> that people were like, wow, God is real. Like, God actually does stuff. God heals. Why do you think we pray today? Because we know that God's a healer. We know that. Does it happen every time? Not necessarily. It doesn't change the truth of it. There's things we don't know. I've laid hands on people, they get healed. I've laid hands on people, they don't get healed. I've laid hands on people, they get healed instantly. I've laid hands on people, and a week later, they're healed. I don't know. I don't get it. But that doesn't change God's word, because I'm not going to let my emotions, my feelings, or circumstance dictate the truth of God's word. I'm going to put my trust and faith in him, and I'm not going to do what a lot of Christians do, try and put their faith in their own faith. My faith is not in my ability to believe enough or try hard enough or read enough or pray enough or fast enough. My faith and my trust is in God and in his abilities. And when it doesn't work out the way that I think, then I'm okay with that. Because it's not me. It's not my will, but his be done. And that's a balance that a lot of us struggle with. We work so hard to, to grow our faith, and we should grow our faith, but our faith has to be in him. 
not in our ability to pray hard enough or believe strong enough or that, that that's that's not what faith is faith is believe in complete trust in god not in ourselves you understand the difference there so anyway, God's doing some awesome things here. And so here, here's what happens. There was kind of some, uh, some Jews who were uh, going around, and they were driving out evil spirits, and they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. So there are some Jewish people who are making money going around trying to uh, cast out spirits, right? So uh, they would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches... I command you to come out. <laughs> like, just, like just that statement right there. That, that's just, that should make you laugh. That's so ridiculous, right? In the name of Jesus that Pastor Danny preaches. Pathetic. That's pathetic. <laughs> Thank you, babe. That's pathetic. That's my wife saying that's pathetic, all right? <laughs> it says, well, one day the evil spirit an answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. <laughs> all right, a little graphic. You know, there, there's some graphic things in the Bible. But so here's what's going on. There's no lordship. Jesus isn't Lord. And because there's no lordship, they're trying to use the name of Jesus for selfish gain. What's in it for me? I go to church because I want something for me. I'm a Christian and I pray because I want something for me. That's called selfish gain. That's exactly what they were doing. They were in it for them, but they had no foundation of relationship, let alone lordship. But when you look at Paul's life in the very same statement, the demon goes, oh, Jesus I know and Paul I know because Paul knows Jesus. <laughs> you know, like, okay, those guys we know. If they said something, we're out of here. But who are you? Right? Who do you think you are? And they're like, give me my money, I'm out of here. <laughs> they didn't even get the money. They just had to leave with nothing. Right? Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So again, lordship is more than just verbal accolades. It's more than just a prayer. It is a positioning of your life, your heart, your thoughts, your mind, your will, your emotions, your dreams, your resources, everything under him. It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Now, that's a pretty heavy statement. But I think it, it really, to me, addresses the importance of lordship. Because if Jesus really is the Lord of your life, then there won't be a single area or a single topic that you reserve the right to have the final say. Want me to say that again? Thank you, I will. <laughs> if Jesus is really the Lord of your life, then there is nothing in your life, not a single topic or anything, that you reserve the right to have the final say on. Not my will, but yours be done. You've got to settle that. If you really believe that God and his way is not obsolete but absolute, then I'm telling you, lordship is where it, that's where it starts. That's where it begins. Maybe you've, you've prayed a prayer at some point in your life. God, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Okay, that's, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not trying to take away from saying a sinner's prayer. You've got to believe in your heart. You've got to confess with your mouth. But the key is that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. That's giving of your life. I prayed a prayer when I was a kid, but I was 21 when I made Jesus the Lord of my life. And you can see the difference <laughs> between my, my teenage and my college years and at the age of 21 when I made him the Lord. 
There was no fruit. There was no evidence. I would have received apart from me. I never knew you because I didn't know him. I had no relationship. I had some religion. I had some understanding. I had some belief. But even demons believe. There's got to be something deeper than that. And that's true lordship. So make sure that you're not reserving the right to make the final decision in any area of your life. So here's the second thing. If you believe that God's way is absolute, it's something I want to call fear of the Lord. And fear of the Lord is different than lordship. Lordship has to do with the position that you put him in. Fear has to do with the respect and reverence. Now, of whether you're looking at the Hebrew or the Greek, whenever it truly talks, the majority of the time when it's talking about the fear of the Lord and us having a healthy fear of the Lord, it's talking about us having a, a positive reverence, a healthy understanding of who God is. A healthy understanding of his power, of his plan, of his purpose. And understanding that, it causes you to think and to act and to live differently. And you value that more than anything else. Proverbs 8.13 says this. It says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. You see, part of, fearing, part of having a healthy fear of the Lord goes back to what I just read there. You will begin to hate what is evil, and you'll cling to what is good. Whenever something happens around you, whenever something happens in you that's wrong, that's evil, that's contrary to God and his word, if you have a healthy fear of the Lord, your spirit will grieve and you will do whatever you can to make a change either in you or to help cause a change around you because you understand this is wrong and you care more about God Amen. than you do about people. I'm not saying you don't care about people, but it's about caring about what people say. Because the Bible is pretty clear, actually. I think I have that, that verse in here. Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. So the minute you're afraid to speak truth or to be a light, you are coming out from under a fear of God and you're putting yourself under a fear of man and that's a snare. Because where does that stop? Where, 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 where do you stop? How much are you going to let yourself be silenced? How much are you going to not change or do because you don't want to offend or hurt or whatever? Now, I'm not talking about being obnoxious and gross. My goodness. Surely you have enough wisdom and common sense to, to speak the truth and love and the things that you do. But somebody's got to stand up for righteousness. Somebody's got to stand up for what is right and moral. At some point, that's what we're called to do. Why do you think we're fighting so hard, like with, you know, with, with abortion? I mean, that's millions and millions and millions of lives that are being destroyed. As a believer, that's got to break your heart. You've got to stand up for that stuff. You've got to fight for that. And fight it politically, sure. Fight it on the, but the, one of the best ways to fight it is, is to love the people around you. And if you know someone who's in a situation who, who isn't sure if they want to keep their baby, love them well, encourage them, speak truth, speak life, do something where you can actually have an impact. So I, I think there's two ways. There's the public and then there's the personal, which is the face-to-face, -face, which is the, the getting around people. But you will never be effective at that if you fear man more than you fear the Lord. And in our culture, it's absolutely the way that it's supposed to be according to them. Right? That's what they say. You need to be afraid. Literally, I had somebody tell me, you need to keep your opinions to your, you're fine to have your opinions, just keep them to yourself. Oh, Guess that's how a republic works, isn't it? <laughs> you keep your opinions to yourself. I want to go. I want to go back to Acts chapter eleven, verse seventeen. It says, "When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, when it became known what had happened to the seven sons of Sceva running naked because they didn't know the Lord, right? It says they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor." 
I want you to get this. The name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Verse 18, it says, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. I want you to get this. When there was a healthy fear of the Lord, the believers, the believers, that's what it's saying, right? The believers openly confessed what they had done. And a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them privately, publicly. Do you understand what they did? The healthy fear of God made them realize what was sin in their lives and they immediately moved on that and they brought all their books that had to do with witchcraft and they burned them publicly. Now get this. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas drachmas give you perspective half a drachma is what somebody lived off of so if there's 50,000 of those in our day and age get ready for this I let somebody else do the math for me that would be the equivalent of 20 million dollars you talk about a healthy fear of the Lord they didn't care how much money they had invested. They didn't care how much they had poured into that. They weren't trying to get a little something out of what they had been so messed up with. They said, it's wrong. I don't want anybody else to be messed up with this. Yeah, I, I have a healthy fear of God. I guarantee you there was people going, what are you doing? Those books have money. They have worth. Go ahead and do your own thing, but what are you doing? $20 million worth of sorcery books. <laughs> That's what a healthy fear of the Lord will do. They publicly declared where they were wrong and where their sin was wrong. And they declared Jesus as Lord. Isn't that powerful? It's absolutely powerful. It completely blows my mind. But let me ask you this question. Do you hate sin? As much as God hates sin? Or do you care more about people's opinion? Do you want to just give in to culture? Or are you willing to look inward and say, okay, God, what's in me? That's not right. God, search my heart. <laughs> it's like David. If there's any wicked way in me, show me. And I'm going to bring it, and I'm going to expose it, and I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm going to publicly declare that I'm serving the one and the true living God. I'm not going to do it ashamedly. I'm going to do it wholeheartedly. That's what fear of the Lord would do, or will do. And then here, here's the last one. If you absolutely believe that, <laughs> that God's way is not obsolete but absolute, then you are going to 100% believe in the authority of the Scriptures. What that means is the Word of God is going to determine your decision-making, your thinking, and it's going to reign supreme over every area of your life. Not your opinions, not your feelings, not, not your ideologies. If God said it, it's the way it is. I accept it. Do you think everything that God says in here has, was easy for me as a Christian to line my life with? Not at first. <laughs> there was some of it I struggled with. But the more I fell in love with God and the more I knew his heart, the more I understood that there is no good thing that he's trying to withhold from me. And if he says it's bad, and if he says it's wrong, there's a reason. And why do I have to wait to find out the reason? <laughs> I don't want to wait to find out the reason why I shouldn't have. I just want to trust God. I just want to say, okay, God, not my will, but yours be done. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4 says this. It says, For the time will come when they will not, and people will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What, what it's talking about is there's a day coming, and I believe it's here, where people just want to find somebody who's going to agree with what they're thinking. And they want people to tell them, you're okay for thinking what you're thinking. 
You're okay for believing what you're believing. And, and they want people to like pat them on the back and encourage them, you're all right. I know people are telling you that's wrong, but you don't worry about it. What a danger, how crazy that is. First John chapter two, verses uh, three through six says this. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, that's when the love for God is truly made complete in them. Do you understand the connection between obedience and love? So if you love him, you'll do what he says. And if you do what he says, it's like this cycle. It completes your love. Because you do what he says, and you get the fruit of obedience, and you fall more in love with him. And you're like, I get it. Okay, God, I want to keep doing what's right. I love you so much. I want to honor you. I want to bless you. I, I want to do your plan, and I want to do it your way. So our, actually, our obedience to God and to his word is actually our visible expression of our love for him. So if we don't honor his word, if we disobey his word, if we do things contrary to his word, we are showing a lack of love Amen. and honor and respect for him. But when we give his word ultimate authority in our life, that's when, that's when amazing things begin to happen. John 17, 17 says, Sanctif sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. I've been trying to nudge the praise team, but I don't know how to. <laughs> I'm not very good at being nonchalant. I'm like, you, up here. <laughs> it's just been that kind of day, so we're just going to roll with it, right? <laughs> I want to close with one more verse. Actually, I want to go back to uh, Acts chapter 11 first. Acts chapter 11, verse 20. So after understanding lordship, after understanding fear of the Lord, verse 20 says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely <laughs> and it grew in power. Isn't that awesome? The authority of God's word just began to go out because people understood what it meant to make Jesus the Lord of their life. They understood what it was to fear God more than to fear man. And then this cycle of loving God, walking in obedience to his word, being blessed for walking in obedience, it began to change them, which began to change the community and the culture. And ultimately, that's why we're here today. I'm telling you, the number one way that you're going to change the culture of your home, the culture of your neighborhood, the culture of your community is the way that you live. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. That's why people don't like it when you tell them that something's not morally right. And they will not come into the light for fear that their deeds are going to be exposed. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus <laughs> washes over you, cleanses you, and purifies you. It's such a beautiful thing. Let's stand up in this place. Will you put my three points back up there, Lori? I just want to ask you a couple of the questions I've already asked you. When it comes to Lordship of Jesus Christ, is there any area, any area of your life that you are still reserving the right to have the final say? If so, it's time to surrender. It's time to surrender. How about fear of the Lord? Is there any sin in your life that you've just chosen to be okay with because the world says it's okay? 
there is, it's time to repent. Say, God, I want to be done. I want to move on. I care more about what you think than about what the world thinks. And then the authority of the scriptures. Are you really taking God at his word? Are there any biblical truths and principles that you're not willing to submit to? If so, it's, it, it's time to make a change. I want to go back to the, the opening when I talked about the Mandalorian stealing the phrase, the way. The phrase I actually liked is they would say, this is the way. And the guys would go, this is the way. It was just settled. It's just done. That's how we're supposed to be with God. All right, God, if you said it, I want to be a follower of the way. If this is the way that I'm supposed to do relationships, then I'm going to do relationships this way. If this is the way that I'm supposed to do finances, then this is the way I'm going to do finances. If this is the way that I'm supposed to, whatever it is, God, if this is the way, then I just settle in my heart, this is the way. Holy Spirit, today in this place, as we just take a moment to reflect, God, I pray that you would lovingly speak to our hearts. God, not, not out of guilt, not out of condemnation, that's the enemy. But God, out of that love that, that wants to draw us into that place of intimacy. God, out of that love that wants to draw us into that place of freedom. Free from the fear of man. Free from what people think. Free, God, from addictions and sin. God, speak to our hearts over this next moment. In Jesus' name.